I think I need, do I need this mic too? I have two right now. Um, you know, usually I have like two turntables and a microphone, but I got two microphones and no turntables. Flipper? We don't have a flicker. Okay, you're my flicker. I'll do it. Okay. Hey, what's up everyone? I'm Betty. Um, I head up marketing analytics and engineering at Netflix. And today I'll be talking to you, next slide please, a little bit about, previous slide please. <laughs> we haven't worked on the timing on this. Um, Incrementality-based conversion metrics, um, which we use, we're starting to use extensively for marketing. Um, and a little bit about Netflix for those of you guys who are not super familiar with us. Um, so as you know, you, we are a nonlinear entertainment programming platform. I think it's the latest description for us. Um, really what a lot of people do is log on to watch a lot of cool content. And we, as you guys know, we have recently started to build out a lot of our own content too that we're all very excited about. Um, so as of right now, we have about 75 million members. That's worldwide. Um, one of the cool things you might have heard about, especially during the net neutrality discussions, is that we account for about a third of the internet traffic in North America during peak uh, viewing hours. Um, our members stream about 125 million hours per day. Uh, everything that you see and use is built off about 2,500 employees right now. Um, and those, for those of you guys who remember that we started as a DVD business, that's actually a US only feature. For the rest of the world, we're only streaming. Next. So what is net marketing and Netflix? Um, as you guys may have read in the news, we expanded into about 160 countries in January. Um, and not everything's gonna be easy going, right? There's gonna be a lot of places that haven't really heard of Netflix or our great content. And so really the job of marketing is to kind of help people who are not yet customers on Netflix better understand what we have to offer. And a lot of that we do is actually through advertising of our movies. And so, you know, for those of you guys who come from like a consumer media background, you know that there's a lot of SEO, SEM in terms of your total usual work with marketing. With Netflix, we pivoted a couple years ago to what we call, or what I would call movie magic marketing, uh, which is that we have found through actually analysis that we get the biggest lifts from new user acquisition when we're marketing our own titles. And so we have, re we have within recent years, transitioned to a model where we really focus our marketing efforts on that. Um, from a how do we scale perspective, we lean very heavily into programmatic marketing. Um, because it's simply faster and easier than to build out local offices in every place that we need to be. Next. So what is marketing analytics and Netflix? And so there's kind of two core subject areas we care a lot about. One is what we call advertising effectiveness. We spend a lot of money, we do a lot of things on program marketing. Are we getting what we need out of this? And the other part, which is a little bit harder, is really around understanding demand generation, demand collection, and that how ultimately can help us inform in terms of better advertisement as well as where to advertise. I think that because we're in what we call movie magic marketing, we see it as more of an art and a science. And so I think that, you know, philosophically, the marketing analytics team see themselves as someone, as a team who really want to lean in scientifically and rigorously into areas that where we want to measure and can measure, but we are also not very gun ho in terms of like pushing into, for example, Optimize, optimizing creatives to inform how do you build new advertisement because we definitely think there's an art to that and we leave that to the experts in our marketing or uh, marketing creatives department. Uh, one of the things that we're all very big on is leaning as much as we can into causal and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, so for us in anything that we do in, uh, in Netflix, the holy grail, as you guys know, is purely causal uh, inferences. And we do a lot of that through A-B testing um, and also on the marketing side through incrementality-based algorithms. Um, but as you guys can imagine, when you're running a lot of marketing campaigns, um, it's very hard to actually associate that with a test and also to address all the day-to-day -day optimization needs. And so as much as we try to, we lean to causal, and we also use some predictive modeling to help us get closer to that, which I'll talk about a little bit. And we also do do more thorough and deep dives in terms of descriptive analytics as well. The one thing that we have really pivoted away from is the concept of using traditional attribution models within marketing, um, because we think that takes us really far away from the true picture of what is uh, effective in advertisement. So, um, I don't know if you guys use this website, it's called Spurious Correlations, it's pretty funny. Um, and so it kind of just shows you how misleading sometimes descriptive analytics can be. And so in this example here, you'll see that, you know, based on this, 
U.S. spending on science, space, and technology is highly correlated with suicides of specific types. I think this other one I really like is about cheese consumption versus like doctor graduates. And I think that these all illustrate examples where it can be really, really misleading if the only thing you're looking at is whether or not things trend together. Um, and we believe that the same things happen within marketing attribution today. Next. And so some of the common methodologies for those of you who are in marketing may, uh, may have heard before is really last touch or equal touch attribution. And fundamentally what it means is that, you know, when a consumer, um, on, in the course of a consumer's journey to let's say convert or to sign up, or to do some action that you desire, you want them to do, there can be a lot of different touch points you have. You can send them emails, you can you know, show them different types of advertisement. And how do we know which method is more effective? How do we know which one actually help them sign up? Um, typically within the market today, people commonly use methodologies or last touch, which means I'm gonna give the conversion credit to the last thing you did right before you signed up. Or equal weight, which means that for everything that I've shown you, in our case, would be different types of advertisement, we're gonna attribute equal weight to that. Um, we do believe this is faulty. Um, so within even our own analysis, we've seen, for example, that we always get the highest like equal touch co attribution conversion rates from IMDB, right? And so, but once we actually moved to an incrementality-based model, one of the things that we saw was that actually it was, it gave us the least amount of incremental uh, signups. And what this means is that like people who use a lot of IMDB already are movie lovers. And they didn't really actually need uh, for us to pay for advertisement on there to induce them to sign up. They would have done that anyways. And so, and this is kind of really the foundation in terms of where we're trying to go to. So this is kind of just like a graphical illustration. Um, so you know, when you have Sally, Stephen, and Grace, they may encounter different websites and see different things on their way to signing up, right? So then the question is that, how do we actually attribute this? Should it be YouTube or NDB? And what we really want to get to is a way to estimate the incremental value of these, of the path from YouTube or IMDB to sign up for the individual users. And this will allow us to inform in terms of where to spend, how much to spend, and when to spend it. So the thing about conversion rates, as you guys know, in marketing, this is pretty much like the KPI, right? I mean, this is pretty much where everything looks, everyone looks at. So we have a ton of use cases for all those metrics should be used. And this includes you know, high level things like campaign planning. Uh, we do a lot of macro and micro campaign optimizations <coughs> using these metrics. Uh, we do a lot of cross campaign learnings and also spend shifts between large campaigns. And then ultimately, we use this to feed into our uh, advertising algorithms as well as A-B tests as well. And so there's a ton of use cases by which any type of conversion metric is used. So what do we do if we want to enable an incrementality-based one? Next. So, and this is kind of one of the things that we had thought about, which is that, you know, incrementality as a concept is really, really attractive, right? Because it's gonna help me be really effective. But how do we actually prioritize this, roll this out? And a lot of things we thought about is really the concept of like, how do we enable the different types of use cases that we know marketing use today for conversions? Um, and what this led us to is really kind of identifying what should be the output. And so typically, a lot of the work that we do is what I would call like a one dimension based predictor. And so for example, if I have a viewer, I can predict, you know, the predicted lifetime value, for example. Or I can have a title, I can say, hey, you know, this is how many watchers I think I'll get within the first 30 days. Or, you know, sometimes we will have tweets and then we actually can score the actionality for the tweets that are tweeted towards our customer service departments. Um, but within this, because there are so many use cases, what we, what we want to do is actually create, essentially, to use like an old school throwback term, like a multi-dimensional cube, where we can essentially calculate and score the incremental conversion rate for every single combination, or as many of them as we can. So, some of the challenges is actually just around like the research and validation. As you can imagine, for there's a lot of different slices of data or dimensions you can use to describe a conversion rate, right? So simple things like by site, by device, by domain, by creative, or even by campaign and country, all the different things there. Um, and for each slice, we actually do a lot of research and validation to ensure that we're actually building out the next piece of the model in the right way. Um, the challenge that we have so far is that a lot of the work is actually revolved around holding a set of variables constant and then predicting for essentially the probability or the incremental probability to, uh, to convert. 
And what this means is that also we end up with the need to actually run the model for a lot of different types of permutations. So as you can imagine, I want to run, I want to create a permutation that's people who visit a YouTube, on mobile, who looked at this campaign in this country, and all the different variations within there. The data coverage is inconsistent. Um, we need enough data to train the model, as you can imagine. But when you have really small markets, like Japan, for example, we simply don't have enough data at the granular that we want sometimes. And then one of the other challenges that we uncover as we kind of rolled this out was really that, you know, I think that our marketers actually are really, really brilliant creative people. And they're very much also used to thinking about conversion rate in the, the more traditional way. And so when we had first talked about incrementality, while they were really excited about the concept, it was a little bit of a black box to them because the metric didn't behave the way that you would, um, that you would expect, let's say, a last touch metric to behave. Um, and so there was a lot of effort that we put into in terms of thinking about how do you make people comfortable with using this so that they can interpret this in the right way and apply it. So um, just kind of like a high level summary of what we did. So you know, the first step is to form the band. And so we created together like a small working group. Their name is ACR Squad. Um, and it had a business analyst, a data engineer, a research scientist, and a part-time product manager. Um, and the way that we thought about it was that we wanted to actually release a set of, a set of permutations to calculate this more based on a specific business use, use case. So for example, I want to actually enable a use case where I can use this metric to optimize day-to-day -day programmatic optimizations for campaign managers um, using, let's say, a specific platform. Then we will go after that first um, because that allows us to move the research faster and then also to roll it out. And we kind of broke our product roadmap like that. And with each cut, we obviously produce a new cut of data. We actually also produce a one pager to help people be more, become more comfortable with understanding how to use it and how to apply it, as well as how to interpret it. So one of the examples that we found was that people were confused. Sometimes you see some very, you, you saw some weird trends when you trended this uh, particular metric over time. And this is something you normally would not see from a last touch attribution metric. And we actually released, we found that was because of the flighting patterns of the impressions. And we released the UI as well as the paper that described how to actually use flighting patterns as a supporting metric to better interpret this. Um, we also had to condense the data quite a bit um, because we actually start with impression level advertising data. And so we actually paired it out dramatically to essentially building, um, you can consider this like navigation path, if you will, um, just like through a website, but this is the navigation path to conversion. And this is what we used to train on. Um, and also, you know, so that we don't have to make the decision about what slices to cut once we have done the research and signed off on it, we do this method called critical mass training, where basically as soon as you hit the threshold for the number of impressions that you needed to kick off the model, we would train every combination that's available there. So I think as of today, we're probably running about 2,500 uh, runs of the models a night with 2,500 different permutations. And the reason why it works so far is because for the first pass, we strongly optimize for speed. And so all this is run in parallel, and I think each run lasts for about one or two minutes. But in terms of future research, we're looking for alternatives to deal with then data, which you get with some of these permutations. But then also with consolidating dimensions and being able to get that estimation better. And that's a little bit about incrementality-based metrics. <laughs>